Oh, no. Yeah, Roland, come on. I know it's going to be tough. Welcome, folks. We're just giving it a moment for everyone to get in and settle in. We would love to hear where you're tuning in from tonight. If you've got some Limit Valley bubbles in your glass, I'd love to hear that, too. We'll get started in just a moment. Hey, Rob, how many of these uh, kind of panel things have you and I done? In I, uh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> it's a lot, isn't it? It's a lot, and I'm glad people are interested. You know, I, I hope I don't sound too boring. <laughs> I always look forward to uh, doing something with you, though. You're the best. <laughs> well, I remember you told me on that uh, white wine seminar at IPNC or Pinot Camp years ago. You said, why the heck are you making Pinot Gris? You making Pinot Gris? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was pretty fun. fun. <laughs> yeah. That was pretty fun. But you always supported me, so I appreciate that. Heck yeah. You make a good Pinot Gris. Right. <laughs> Wish I could sell more of it. <laughs> you know, the fun fact I always enjoyed was um, O'Donnell one time pointed out that there's more Pinot Gris um, planted in the Willamette Valley than in Alsace. Wow. That's, that's still true, I guess. Is it? Isn't that wild? Yeah. Old and David Levitt. <laughs> Pinot Gris is still allowed as a champagne grape. I don't know. Is it really? Good. I really like it as a, as a rosé. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Goodness. Um, man. Agreed uh, to say so good. I Thomas agree. Thomas Hausman made a rosé out of Pinot Gris. That was so good. Ago. Wow, that was good. How did he do that without getting it bitter? Where did he get the, did he add color or was it just that year? Or? He said it was just skin contact and uh, pressed off. But I think you can do it if you, probably if you uh, cut the pressings early. Mm -hmm. Be real cautious that, about that. That was a beautiful wine. I love that wine. Yeah. All right, I we've got we a good, uh, <laughs> uh, I agree, actually. <laughs> On that note, uh, we have a good critical mass here, so I think we should get started. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Bubbles Masterclass. I'm Julia Burke from the Willamette Valley Wineries Association, and I'm thrilled that so many of you from all over the country and beyond could join us for an amazing conversation tonight between some of our Willamette Valley sparkling wine masters. <laughs> Joining us this evening, we have Chris Fladwood of Soder Vineyards, Rollin Souls of Rocco Winery, and Rob Stewart of our Stewart & Co. Last but certainly not least, our host, Catherine Cole, author of Sparkling Wine Anytime. Thanks everyone for being here. Catherine, they're all yours. Well, hello everyone. I'm just holding up the book if you can see it. Um, <clears throat> thanks so much for joining us for what I think will be a sparkling conversation. Pardon me for that. Um, as a bubbles enthusiast, I have to say it's a really exciting time to be living in the Willamette Valley. We are definitely having a moment right now with new labels and producers emerging, it seems like every week, making fabulous sparkling wines. But today we will be hearing from three longtime pract practitioners of sparkling winemaking. Um, and this event is called a masterclass because we are really joined by three masters of the art of vinifying delicious effervescent Willamette Valley wines. Now I'm going to sort of reintroduce everyone with a little more information. And you know, it's a little known fact that Rob Stewart actually had a small sparkling wine label from 1983 to 1994 called Cuvée Montagne. And since 1999, he has been quietly making some killer sparkling wine over at our Stewart and Company in McMinnville. And back in 1987, Rollin Souls founded Argyle Winery in Dundee, which is of course now world famous for its Willamette Valley sparkling wines. And you can find his exceptionally delicious personal sparkling label, RMS, over at Rocco Winery in Newburgh these days. And back in 1997, Tony Soder, a native Oregonian, returned from the Napa Valley to the Willamette Valley to make traditional method bubbly under his own label in the Yamhill Carlton Appalachian. We are joined this evening by longtime Soder winemaker, Chris Fladwood, who has been working his magic in the Soder cellar since 2009. So I'm just so excited for this conversation, you guys. I'm, I'm, I think I'm gonna learn so much from you. 
Um, now, sparkling wine can be made in a variety of ways, but this evening we are going to focus on the classical or traditional method, the same method used in Champagne, as well as other traditional sparkling wine regions, such as Limoux in the south of France, Franciacorta in Trento in northern Italy, the Penedès in northeastern Spain, and so on and so on. So I thought we could start by talking about place. Um, I just listed a number of outstanding international sparkling wine regions, and I really think the Willamette Valley is ready to join their ranks. So Rollin, let's start with you. Obviously, the Willamette Valley is noted for producing excellent still wines from Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, which are, of course, the two top traditional method uh, grapes. So it, it seems natural that the Willamette Valley should emerge as the nation's foremost traditional method sparkling wine region. But I'd like to dig a little bit deeper because sparkling wine and still wines are very different. So what about the Willamette Valley makes it an ideal place to farm grapes for sparkling wines? Okay, yeah, and I agree with you. The Willamette Valley is the region for sparkling wine. Uh, staked my entire life on that kind of thing, uh, premise. But if you start really large and then you go down to small, the large thing about the Willamette Valley that you'll notice right away when you're driving around in your car or on your bicycle is that you don't see Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot and Sauvignon Blanc, a warmer climate varieties growing here. And if you're riding around on your bike in Champagne, uh, same thing, you're not gonna see Cab and Merlot. So that's the first indication that, oh man, this might be a good spot. Uh, the second part is that all of our vineyards that are successful are on hillside slopes, they're not in the valley floor. Uh, and so those hillside slopes have more integrity or, or offer more integrity to grapes, character, character to those grapes. Or it's a, you want to be in that aspect. And then any of y'all that fly into Portland, uh, Oregon, you'll notice that you're flying by a mountain with snow on it year round, Mount Hood, and you're at the 45th parallel, which is really key to making great sparkling wine in my uh, view. If you follow that 45th parallel, it goes above Toronto. So we're, I mean, we're very high up here. And what all of that does is it wraps up to create an environment where Pinot Noir and Chardonnay can express full fruit flavor at low sugars, which is what we want for sparkling wine, without losing high natural acidity. And that, 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 that combination does not happen unless you're in a cool growing region, high latitude, which is the Willamette Valley. Cool, huh? <laughs> Very cool. Okay, so cool growing region, high latitude, or high latitude. We've got that. What about uh, elevations and aspects? It's not, it's not necessarily the same vineyard or same block of a vineyard that you would use for uh, still Pinot Noir, correct? In general, what you're going to want to do is run up the hill uh, here in the Willamette Valley, uh, because it, and what's really amazing at the 45th parallel, what happens is small differences in latitude, or I mean, in elevation, actually show up in the grapes. So for example, in the Willamette Valley, 200 feet difference in elevation where you're growing grapes can mean up to 10 to 14 days difference in picking. So you might pick you know, grapes at 600 feet, and then you can go fishing for 10 days, come back and uh, be picking something at 800 feet. Isn't that wild? If you're at lower latitudes, like let's say Mendocino, you need 2,000 feet of difference to get that distance and ripening. So what that means is we can kind of work our way up the hill and pick sparkling wine fruit at its peak of ripeness. And the thing about sparkling wine is it's um, the window for getting it perfectly right, that ripe flavor, not green flavor, and not overblown ripe flavor and without losing high natural acidity, especially if you're using uh, uh, our new uh, Burgundy clones with Chardonnay is really tough to dial that in. So we move up the hill. We wanna pick as late as possible sparkling wine. I think that makes the best uh, expression and gives you the most uh, mineral and, and just this nervosity in these sparkling wines. Uh, so high elevation, late ripening, would be key and we can do that here on the Willamette Valley. 
I think nervosity is my new favorite word. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, now um, I'm curious about subappellations. We've got a number of subappellations in the Willamette Valley, and I know that you all are, are working with some different ones. Rob, you tend to blend, uh, correct? Blend vineyards. So, do you have favorite subappellations of the Willamette Valley for sourcing your fruit for sparkling? Well, I, I think, and to to tack on to what Rollin said, uh, altitude is key and maybe aspect. Um, I uh, started the the current production of the Rosé d'Or um, primarily with fruit from Temperance Hill. And if you go to Temperance Hill, uh, you go to the very top of the spot. It kind of looks a little bald up there, but um, it's at 814 feet, I believe. And um, that's what attracted me to, to that spot. The um, more recently, I've been working with a vineyard called Menifee, which it's on uh, volcanic soil, um, and you guys might want to correct me on this, but it's it's um, it's oceanic volcanic. Basically, it's the coastal right. range facing inward, so it's a southeast facing, and it's still uh, this particular spot where I get the pomar and actually um, a small amount of roussan, which would never ripen, and it still doesn't really ripen here. Um, a small amount of roussan and some pinot blanc. Um, that's all from the Menifee Vineyard. And so I'm looking for cooler sites, exactly what Ro like what Roland was saying. And, um, and then the Pinot Noir that I get for a still wine from Menifee, it's the last thing I pick. In fact, we just picked it 10 days ago. So it's, it's the last thing to come in. So it's overall a cooler site, but then I picked the highest altitude of that site. So it's all about elevation, it sounds like. Um, what about timing? Chris, we haven't heard from you yet. Um, wh when do you harvest for sparkling? Um, it's probably easy to say we, we harvest um, a bit earlier than still wine. Um, it's much harder to say exactly when every vineyard, every elevation is going to dramatically, um, well, they're all going to have an effect on the timing of harvest. Um, I pick I have blocks here at Mineral Springs um, that I use for sparkling wine traditionally versus still wine um, that, are, that are side by side. I'm looking for a different expression from um, each of these batches of grape. Uh, sometimes I use um, half a block for still wine and half a block for sparkling wine. In those instances, I'm generally picking the sparkling wine um, approximately 10 days before. So um, sometimes it's two weeks before uh, a given vintage, depending on the weather pattern, depending on how the sugar is accumulated in the grapes and how the flavor is tracking with, with said sugar and said acid, um, that, that can dramatically affect things. So 2011, uh, which was one of the more dramatic vintages here in Oregon, um, we were, things were moving pretty slowly. Um, we made a lot of sparkling wine at Soder. Um, it was a really, really beautiful opportunity. And what we saw is we had um, a greater amount of time to pick in between sparkling wine and still wine because the weather was very forgiving. It was very gentle. Um, and the opposite can be true in a year like say 2015 or 2018 where it's a pretty voluptuous, pretty warm and um, a riper year. The distance between or the space between picking for sparkling wine and for still wine can sometimes be seven or eight days. Um, it's really important to pick your sparkling wine before the potential alcohol gets too high where it will impede uh, a second fermentation in the bottle. We have to account for um, an extra increase in alcohol that happens uh, when we move into the, uh, the tirage period. For sure, yeah. So it sounds like you are not so much going for higher elevations, but just timing your, your harvest time a little early. Um, I don't, I don't strictly go for higher elevation. Um, I'm looking for more like distinctive character uh, in grapes. Um, Mineral Springs, um, I make sparkling wine from two different vineyards, uh, Mineral Springs being sort of our home base here. It's our estate vineyard in the Yamhill Carlton. It starts out at 350 feet and moves up to about 500. I pick for sparkling wine from 300 feet up to 500 feet different blocks here and there, again, looking for those different expressions. Um, in contrast, uh, we also make sparkling wine from our Eola Amity vineyard, which is sub uh, substantially higher in elevation. It's 650 feet 
gives me again a very different expression picked a few uh picked at least a week later if not 10 days later than than yam hill carlton so i'm looking for more yeah elevation matters um but i can find um that point in time that exists at a little lower elevation again it's not fair to call 350 feet low elevation that's still well above um the sort of threshold where you get the really, really high quality um, maturity. Hmm. Um, Catherine, I one thing that, that we did, if you don't mind, uh, yeah. it, it, what I thought about, it, it, that I got really excited about is young people were starting to drink Prosecco's. And, um, and I mean, really the sparkling wine drinking around the country has gone up astronomically. And I just thought, you know, all these young folks drinking um, Prosecco, eventually they're going to come up to Method Champenoise land. And so at Argyle, we, I looked for a very high elevation. In fact, it's above, just above where uh, a vineyard that Chris is talking about in the Eola Amity Hills. And we bought it specifically to do sparkling wine. So it's kind of cool. We call it Spirit Hill at Argyle. And it's going it, to, it just makes some really mineral uh, expressions for sparkling wine and then we also had the first you know vineyard designated wines which i think is a really fun uh, uh, place to go for future sparkling wine makers to designate vineyards specifically for growing for sparkling wine it's not like a knee jerk oh man it didn't get ripe this year so i guess i'll turn it into sparkling wine uh, there's a lot of thought go going into where should i source my sparkling wine to make the best that we can do and, uh, yeah, I'm hearing more and more of that in the valley. Uh, vineyards that are vineyards that are specifically set aside for sparkling production. That's exciting. It is. So I think, that um, Catherine, do you mind if I just chime in real quick? Because um, I think Rollin touched on a really beautiful point. And um, what I what I failed to say was um, part of elevation and part of my style of sparkling wine is one of more intense flavor and um, where that might be a little less traditional. It's very, um, we're trying to constantly push that bar of how intense, um, how much flavor, how much personality we can get in the sparkling wine. And um, here at Mineral Springs, again, between 350 and 500 feet, we're able to get a little earlier ripening um, and a little bit more intense, intense flavor, low yielding vines leading towards just beautiful concentration of flavor, which does translate uh, into the sparkling wine and uh, anyone that's familiar with the uh, with soda sparkling wines brut rosé and blanc to blancs can definitely sort of taste that uh, taste that vineyard right there in the, in the bottle well that brings up the question you know i've heard people say terroir really isn't an issue with sparkling wine it's really the imprint of the winemaker um, but then you know you do have single vineyard bubblies that are very distinctive so what is the role of terroir How, can can we taste the vineyard when we taste a willamette valley sparkling wine Robert? I'm sorry, Catherine. <laughs> I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, you, you're blended here, <clears throat> so you might be the most interesting person to answer this question. I was asking about um, terroir. Is, can, you, can you taste the place in a sparkling wine? We certainly pay a lot for champagnes that are from a single flow, so. Well, I I am I was one of the last people to to uh, vote yay or nay on um, appellation and subappellation in the Willamette Valley because I really believe in blending. And I think um, even with sparkling wine, I'm sort of roundabout answering your question. I think you can taste wines from a particular place, but you can have many winemakers do their own spin on that. So that's where, you know, put a whole bunch of wines made from the same place, but a bunch of different people that really would answer the question. What I find is there are vineyards, the vineyards that I work with are distinctive every year. And I have always been, uh, you know, the, I can't, I always say it wrong, but the sum of the parts, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And so to me, and I think um, Rollin and Chris um, would agree with this, maybe, maybe Rollin, I know Chris would, uh, <laughs> um, but you keep pushing for complexity, you keep pushing to make a more interesting wine. And, and I do that by blending as one of the many techniques I use to make more complexity. But there's a point where you 
um, as I say, go over the tips of your skis. And so um, then I stop, but I'm always, what I love about making sparkling wine is um, it's, always, it's the most challenging wine to make. Um, forget about all the, the technical aspects of it, but making the wine is the most complex wine that one could make. And, and, and then you go into that secondary fermentation and <laughs> that changes, changes the game a lot too. So hope that answers the question. Well, maybe we should um, move on to base wines. Uh, we're getting a lot of excellent questions that I want to dig into, but I kind of want to follow the progression. So we started in the vineyard and maybe we can talk a little bit about the base wine, which is the first wine you make or the first fermentation. Um, and actually this is more of a vineyard question. Um, Chris, I'm wondering, I, one thing I know about your uh, methodology is you, um, go with a pretty low crop load of two to two and a half tons per acre um, when you're harvesting to make that base wine. Um, so why is this? Because, you know, I, I know in Champagne, you can have a yield of up to what would be the equivalent of up to five tons per acre. So uh, why crop so low for, for base wine? Um, that's, a, that's a great question and um, probably a lot of different answers to that question. Um, I think it's pretty easy for pretty much any winemaker of still wine, um, especially a Pinot, a Pinot Noir maker or Chardonnay maker to know that yield affects concentration and um, overall sort of density of the wine. Um, that's, true with, that's true with base wines as well. Um, my particular style is one where I'm again, trying to build um, a pretty intense personality, not intense in tannin, um, like maybe with still wine, but intense with fruit profile um, and, and, and acidity and, and trying to balance that. The only way to get intense fruit profile, especially when you're trying to pick things that, you know, 19 bricks of, of sugar is to have a pretty low yielding vine. Um, a low yielding vine makes for a concentrated wine. That's a terrible rhyme, but it's completely the truth. Um, so it's very intentional. Um, Again, every year is going to give you a different balance of fruit pro profile. So it's not, it's not as easy as just saying, yeah, you hang, you know, two and a half tons per acre on this space and is, is the magical number. Um, good winemakers have to interpret what the current summer looks like it's going to give you and try to balance out uh, the, the crop according to the canopy and according to the weather. It's what makes this so hard. As Rob says, making sparkling wine is, is just tremendously difficult. Um, and it takes many, many years. And again, I haven't been making sparkling wine as long as either Rob or, or, or Ron. I've been making it for a while, and have, but I've had enough sort of trials and tribulations along the way and have learned my lessons from those looking more for what, what is balance. Balance rules everything. Um, so yeah, it's easy to say, well, you can crop the, the vines at five or six tons per acre and make a really nice sparkling wine. And that is totally acceptable and the beautiful examples of that. But it's also, I think, very acceptable to say, well, I'm looking for, again, more concentration, more personality, more persistence on the palate. Um, and that is more in line with what my style looks like. I want when people to drink, when people drink my sparkling wine for them to be able to say, yeah, I can taste the vineyard. I can taste the fruit, whether it's, uh, again, a Blanc de Blancs, whether it's a Brut Rosé. Um, I make four, four sparkling wines. And uh, three of them are from a single vineyard. And the other one is uh, a blend of uh, both different vineyards and, and different vintages. And um, I think there's beauty in both of those. And I think what sparkling wine is about is showcasing a, a brief period of time for a given vineyard or a given bit of grapes that exists for this much time. And you're trying to capture it right there. And that's what makes it's, it's the first decision and the most important and difficult decision to make is when do I pick those grapes and when do I capture it? Um, so um, I like lower yields um, and I think lower yields reveal a lot more about the character uh, of the grapes. And uh, again, for my style, I'm really looking to exemplify what is, what is this block of grapes? And what does this vineyard have to say about it in, in, in a given vintage? So um but I've, again, I've had, I've had lots of uh, lovely champagnes that maybe aren't made in that, that same fashion. And for us, we're trying to make true sort of Oregonian sparkling wines. 
Well, I think all three of you are, are working with those low yields. Um, and we have a question here from Mark. Um, how would you compare the tasting profile of Willamette sparkling versus Sonoma sparkling? Is it due to the ripeness difference between the two AVAs? And kind of thinking about what you're talking about with yields, Chris, um, you know, sometimes with the uh, West Coast, I'll just say West Coast sparkling wines, I do get this kind of overripe flavor profile that's more kind of raisiny than I want it to be, less fresh. And um, Willamette Valley so far has managed to stay on that fresh side, even with these lower yields. So what is the difference? I don't want to, I don't want to trash yeah. the wine um, region. But I, and again, I think Roland and Rob can let, also- Let me speak. jump in, let me jump in here, Christopher. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's, all, it's would, all yours, Roland. What I would say is that, um, uh, that you, because we're, you know, that 45th parallel again, and yeah. we do push our ripening period into September, uh, and, uh, hopefully sometimes in October, uh, that we really do see real differences block to block, vineyard to vineyard. And uh, through Argyle and through RMS, I could line up base wines for you that are, you know, all of them are Pinot and they all taste completely different from each other even though they're going to end up being put into this product or that product for a sparkling wine. So that's exciting for us. And we, and we don't have a consistency of yields here in the Willamette Valley like you would in Sonoma. You can almost dial it in. Okay, now I'm going to get X number of tons per acre, and I'm going to pick on you know, August 29th. And, and it happens most often here. That's one of the dangers of being so high up. We're as far north as you can ripen Pinot Noir and Chardonnay on this coastline here. It really makes a difference. And I also want to say that because of this fruit, because, because of the fruit we grow here is uh, you know ripening at the very end of possible. Uh, when we go to process the wines, you know, to squeeze the grapes, we have a. It just feels like we have a firmer grape to squeeze and I'm gonna tell you, so many sparkling wines are ruined by uh, people not knowing how to press the juice out of the grapes. It's a very delicate process and you gotta, you gotta stay on top of it and taste that juice as it's coming out of the press constantly in order to figure out where to make the cuts uh, that are gonna make the wine taste the way it's supposed to taste here in the Willamette Valley. Yeah, let's let's talk about that for a second because you know when people ask me why is sparkling wine so expensive? Well, there are a number of reasons, and one of them is uh, you just can't use as much of the the juice, right? I mean, how much how much are you all pressing your fruit, Rob? We haven't heard from you in a while. How how tell tell us about your pressing process? Well, well, my pressing process is I put it in the press, but I don't put any pressure on it. I roll it around, and I usually get around a. 100 gallons per ton, whereas if I pressed it off, I might get 160, 170. And, um, and I, I, in many years, and I, you know, I, with people that work for me, it's a training thing, but so I'll show them, okay, here's, here's the stuff first coming out and, and taste the flavor, look at the pH and the acidity. And then I know we're not going to use when we start putting like uh, 0.2 bars on the, on the press. Um, so we take that cut. I know that's going to be sparkling wine. And we start looking at it and you can see the acid just drop and the pH shoot up. But even more importantly, the flavors get what I call muddy. So, mm -hmm. you know, they're not focused bright right there. And, and so when, when I say press, I don't really press it. I just put it in the press and, and roll it for five minutes and that's it. So it's just free run juice, basically. Mm -hmm. so, this sounds like a terrible uh, financial plan to just. It's <laughs> <laughs> the definition of sparkling wine, but it's so funny. It <laughs> is. It's so true. <laughs> well, think about it. When you start a sparkling wine enterprise, you uh, grow the grapes, make the wine, and you bottle it three years in a row. And then maybe by the fourth year, you you grow the grapes, you make the wine, and then you're re releasing the first wine that you made. So the capital, that's it's intense, the capital to build a sparkling wine program at the, at the very beginning is brutal. And the only benefit is that um, down the road, if you age your, uh, say you can't sell your sparkling wine, believe me, it doesn't go down. It tastes better and better and better the longer you leave it on the yeast leaf. So that's 
that's one small benefit of making sparkling wine is, is uh, people love to drink older sparkling wines. I, I, um, I wanted to comment about, uh, we call that state to the Southwest Baja, Oregon. Um, but back to the old uh, Pinot Camp story, when you look at summer solstice, we have an hour and a half more sunlight than they do in Napa, but our temperatures, temperatures are so much cooler. And um, so we have more sunlight and that might speak to where Chris is saying, we get more intensity of flavor for our sparkling wines. We also maintain the high acidity. So that's a big difference about from where we are versus if you will, California. And California is a big state. Can't pick on them all, but. <laughs> uh, well, you know, as long as we're still talking about the vineyard, it's interesting because I often think about dosage, which is the last step when I'm thinking about harvest, because I'm wondering if you as winemakers, when you harvest and you're tasting that fruit, do you already know, like, oh, I know what the dosage is going to need to be on this wine. And I should stop and say the dosage is the, the final, uh, actually there was a question about it. Let me see if I can find it. Um, Charles uh, asked uh, any time to talk about the dosage, any brandy was his question. Um, but it's it's the final little uh, finishing touch that you add because um, you got a little space left in the top of the bottle and there, you, you need to put something in there, correct? But it's, it's also to, um, to even out the 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 sugars and the acidity. So who wants to who wants to speak to that? And I'll, and I'm very curious if that's something you think about at harvest. Um, I'm happy to jump in. Um, <clears throat> I'd say no. I've got too many other things to think about during harvest. Um, <laughs> um, dosage is, I think, a, a magical vessel for um, the last sort of artistic means to make your wine as good as possible. And um, but that really kind of comes many, as Roland described, you know, sparkling wines um, for what we're all doing are three, four, five, six, seven, sometimes 10 years down the road, the first time you see them. It is, um, I would say, generally impossible to try to predict completely what your wine's going to be like on the other side of this. Um, maybe someone out there can do it, but um, I haven't figured it out yet. Um, I think. Dosage is, I go into dosage, I go into um, tasting the, the, the wine as it comes out of tirage after it's sparkling, it's been fermented twice, I've riddled it down. Um, I start to taste the wine and right then um, start to figure out, okay, what's my, what's my range gonna be? What, is, what does this wine need to become the best um, representation of what I want all of you guys to see? Um, and again, sometimes that's three, sometimes that's 10 years uh, down the road. So, so no, I don't, I don't think it's, it's necessarily possible to uh, completely predict what your level of dosage is. I think, again, dosage is one of the most important aspects to make the most balanced wine possible for, for my style of winemaking. And I trial um, everything from, from no dosage every year up to maybe 10 grams per liter of dosage. And uh, I think one of the beautiful things about dosage is sometimes, no matter what you're, where you're going to end up in dose level, sometimes when you, if you don't taste the dosage trials, you don't learn enough about your, your wine at hand. Sometimes they teach you so much that you didn't even know. Um, they reveal aspects of the wine that you maybe couldn't have seen because you have some sort of preconceived notions of what that wine's supposed to be. Um, I think no dosage is, 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 uh, is not necessarily the answer unless it proves it to be the very best wine. And there's many, many, many different answers. It's really, again, up to the sort of the winemaker, the artist to choose uh, what's, the, what's the wine that, that we want the world to see. Yeah, I want to hear some more, of that. So, Rollin or Rob, I want to hear you also weigh in on the Brut Zero thing. Because <laughs> zero dosage is very chic right now, but what are your thoughts? Robert, hop in, baby. <laughs> no, you're dying to talk about that. <laughs> well, I, I, I think that Chris's methodology is very similar to, to ours here. Um, the, the objective when it comes to dosage is what are you going to make? How are you going to make the best wine? And, and when you taste it with zero, you know, right then and there, okay, I think I can add some middle. I can add this aromatic. I could you know, there, there's so many things that you can tweak. And, um, and, and I think Roland uh, 
said once, not too re or quite recently, that <laughs> people just that just go with zero dressage because it's the thing to do um, are missing the point. Um, if it makes the best wine, great. But my experience is um, there's always something else you can do to just dial it up a little bit better. And um, and and I've, uh, I've in, in 10 milliliters, I remember one particular um, release of the Rosé d'Or, we had seven different wines in there. And I kept saying, what do I need? What do I need? What do I need? And, and then finally I found it. But it's, it's really interesting. I noticed, I think it was Charles again, was asking about brandy. And, um, and years ago, I used a brandy that I found in bulk from California. And it was really, it was delicious on its own, quite frankly. Um, mm. And I found a half a milliliter in a 750 milliliter bottle of wine, totally changed the wine and I loved it. Um, I could never find that brandy again because that company went out of business. I'm, I, I always look at brandy and I don't look at cheap brandy, um, but recently I've even looked at, uh, there's a Zacapa rum, which is the 23, which is a multi-year rum. Um, that might be the answer, but I'm gonna try looking at it but I'm not going to do it to say, I've got to do it. It's, it's just, it's, it's that last bit of artistic um, touch as Chris mentioned. Okay, so some of our audience might be wondering, wait a second, sparkling wine is generally pretty low in alcohol. So how are you able to add uh, fortified? Well, think about, a half, think about a half a milliliter of brandy and how much are you really bumping up the alcohol? Um, yeah. So, you know, take a half a milliliter brandy and put in a glass of water and tell me you're going to get lit up by that. <laughs> it's yeah. just not going to change it that much. So it's and just even, even, something. Yeah, well, even, you know, I think Rob was talking about 10 milliliters added into 750 milliliters. Well, out of that 10 milliliters, only five is actually the wine that he's adding. So, I mean, the contribution in dosage is teeny tiny but it's like Mighty Mouse. It makes an incredible difference. And I think Chris was talking too about, you know, we use this to build middle palate, we, to, to uh, give you better length, and it actually can be used to uh, freshen up the wine as well. And so there's so many good things to do with dosage. And one of the other advantages, and Chris alluded to this too, we do a ton of trials because all three of us, nobody in our family's ever made sparkling wine before. And I mean, that's good news, bad news. We don't, we don't have the tradition that teaches as well. When you have a wine like this, you do this. We don't know. And so uh, we make up our own trials and we, and I can't tell you how many times uh, making dosages, I think, okay, it's gonna send the wine this way. And it's a completely wrong, completely wrong. And believe it or not, you can add more sugar and make the wine taste more acidic. It's just, it's, it's oh, counterintuitive. Yeah. And so kind of with my dosage thing is I start thinking, I do start thinking about the wine as I'm, you know, making the base wine. And, uh, and three years to 10 years later, I think, well, what was that vintage like? And I'll go, well, you know, maybe I'll try some older stuff this time, or maybe I'll try a little younger stuff, or maybe this needs more Pinot or more Chardonnay. It's, it's so much fun. When it's dosage trial day, uh, and we, you know, I've always had the thing where we do it for one week, and then we wait a week, and kind of, you know, and then we go back another week just to prove whether or not we're wrong or not. But when it's, when it's dosage trial day, I can't wait to get up in the morning. It is so much fun. It's it's a thing in winemaking that you know what what would you think, guys? Ninety percent of winemakers never experience, and yeah. it, it's 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 awesome. It's just awesome. And that point you made, Roland, about um, adding more sugar can sometimes make the acidity more noticeable. Um, David Spear, who, who started the wonderful uh, champagne bar Ambonet, had a yeah. wonderful way of describing that, where sometimes you taste a uh, sparkling wine and the RS is really high, but it's like super like tin foil or something in your mouth. And he said, it's like um, when you brush your teeth and drink orange juice, like sometimes the sugar for some reason just makes it even more sort of 
biting on the palate. So you really need to be careful with that. Yeah, well, that's somebody that screwed it up. <laughs> I, I made some with some a little bit higher sugars, and they were just smooth and delicious, and they were bright for the moment. Um, yeah, it just kind of depends, right? But you can't add too much. It, what I call it, it when you uh, uh, and uh, uh, Fladwood will crack up when he hears this because I'm sure he's heard it before. Is when you you try to go, you you start at a number that's low, and then you go too high. And then you back off and know where you're supposed to be when it comes down to sugar. And um, when it starts to taste what I call sweet and sour, that's mm -hmm. when you went too far. <laughs> Roland's, Roland's right on it, sweet and sour. Um, yeah. Unless you go too far, you don't know what, what's, uh, what's perfect, though. So um, yeah. I find it really important to, to be very thorough. Um, Roland um, said very clearly, um, Dose trials will completely fool you, even uh, an extraordinarily experienced winemaker, which is nothing but interest to me. I think one thing I've found to be common with all great winemakers is they're always after adventure and after learning. And dosage, dose trials, if you forego those, I think you've just foregone an opportunity to become smarter, both uh, in the short term and in, and in the long run. Um, I absolutely love tasting dose trials like Ryan does, uh, Ron, sorry. Um, it is an absolute thrill. It's a lot of work to put together, put down dose trials, but the amount of information you're about to sort of glean uh, about your wine is absolutely incredible. And I would never ever want to just say, no, I'm just not gonna do dose trials and do a no dose wine just to do one. Yeah. Well, I want to move on to the question of vintage versus non-vintage, but there's one more thing I want to ask about. Um, I, I think of, when I think of sparkling wines, I think of two styles. I, I call them the submarine style and the galleon style. Um, and since this is a masterclass, I'm allowed to get a little geeky and talk about reductive versus oxidative winemaking styles. And I'm just curious, um, the three of you with your base wine, um, you know, what, which way have you decided to go? What's your preference? Um, do you like a base wine that's that's more kind of oxidative that's been in barrel or, or do you like a base wine that's been in steel and is very crisp can you maybe address that robert <laughs> i know what rob's answer is going to be <laughs> i think i should go last on that one <laughs> no way i want you to set the stage <laughs> well um so um there are sparkling wines that are 30 and 40 years in tirage made in France. They're hard to find. You've got to go to France to get them. Um, and I find those very intriguing. Um, for me, age, age in, in the wine or perception of age is a part of complexity. And um, you can go overboard on it and, um, and you can go underboard on it. And the last thing I want is a, is a, you know, a pretty little wine that has great acidity and floral notes, but there's no substance to it. So to me, age wines give you more of that substance. Now, um, I will tell you, and this might be self-embarrassing, but I had a gentleman in uh, Memphis, Tennessee, taste uh, a cuvee of mine about 10 years ago. And he came up to me, he was a little bit drunk, and he said, I love this wine. I love this wine. It's like Maker's Mark with sparklers. And I, <laughs> and I said, oh, and so he came up and said, I'm, I'm really embarrassed. It's not necessarily wrong. Uh, <laughs> uh, what did you say? <laughs> I said, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, <laughs> Makes a great Manhattan, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I'm fully aware of... Um, of going overboard on that. And um, the thing is our wines, our rosé d'or is five, six years in tirage. And that's, you know, talk about learning things. Um, you put a wine in tirage and then you take it out of, you, you riddle it and disgorge it. And it's hard to project that many years down the line. So I'm gradually backing off on more older wine and my most recent cuvee that we, we, we put in Taraj just this past year. Um, it's only like 15% of some of my older reserve wines. 
but it still is an important factor. And uh, so I think there's value to it, but I, I and, and I like older sparkling wines too. I like, like bigger, heftier ones. I enjoy, you know, I, this is kind of sexist and Maria would get upset with me. I like pretty little dresses, but, <laughs> but that's what those wines are. You know, I want something a little more substance. Sounds yeah, good. well, this might be a, a good moment to talk about what you've got going on, Rob, with your, um, I, I was asking about barrels earlier, uh, with your, your system of aging your base wines, um, you have something very, very interesting. Um, it's almost like a Solera, like you might find in the Jerez region. Um, this is this is a form of fractional blending where you have vintages going back, I believe, to 1999. I'm wondering if you could describe that to uh, folks who probably aren't aware that you've you've been running this amazing system of blending wines for so long. Well, um, I uh, actually you mentioned earlier that I had a a, a label called Cuvia Montagna, and I. Um, I was doing the same thing. In fact, I still have some wine that was put in Tourage in 85, it's still in Tourage. Um, but I remember meeting with um, Terry Rotoro, who was a, a, a well-known chef in Seattle. And he looked at me when we were tasting this wine years ago. And he said, you know, you should start over. So, so I said, okay, <laughs> well, I get it. And, you know, talk about you know, this is how you learn about making wine is by making mistakes. So um, well, that's where the 99, starting in 99, I started over again. And the concept is is very much like the Solera where uh, we made um, in our first release, we made five barrels of base wine, Van Clare, I think the French call it, uh, in 99. And we made five more barrels of uh, similar stuff in 2000. And in 2001, we put a mix of those two in Tirage and then held half the wine back. Um, four years later, we released that as our first Rosé d'Or and, and that's continued on. So I actually, in our cellar, have a 99 through uh, 2020 Solera system that when I start looking at my Cuvée from the 21 vintage, I'll look at the old and new. And what it allows me to do, and Chris mentioned 2011, which was, uh, in my opinion, a fantastic vintage actually. Uh, um, it's very different than uh, say a 2014 or 15. Um, I can add more or less of the new wine and the old wine. And I'm a big fan of non-vintage. I'm a big fan of the big champagne houses that have a style or their concept of a style. I want a style. And um, I think vintages are really interesting but I want a consistent style. And so, yes, I have older wine and newer wine. And I actually, I'm excited because Henri Giraud will be here at IPNC this summer. And I've met him several times and I absolutely love his wines. And um, I finally got out of a French winemaker that unlike other large producers where they have different vintages of base wine in their cellar, I said, well, I don't have a lot of dough. You know, I don't have the money to and the space and all that stuff. And he does exactly the same thing. He says, yeah, that's what you should do. So I felt a little bit vindicated after making so many mistakes all these years that maybe this was the right direction. And it's, I mean, more than if people are familiar with champagne, the term perpetual reserve or perpetual cuvee, it's more than that because you really literally have the barrels stacked on top of each other like you would see in Jerez. I mean, it's really impressive. Um, and, and Chris, you know, I know you've been doing a little dabbling with the multi-vintage uh, bottlings as well. And don't you have a, a something you're going to unveil in the spring? Is that right? Yeah, we've got um, a, new, a new sparkling wine coming out. So this will be sort of our fourth uh, sparkling wine, which should round out the portfolio pretty nicely. Um, like Rob, I think I'm fascinated with how uh, base wines, we're talking about base wines, un- carbonated wines, um, fascinated with how they age. They have their own trajectory. And again, um, they develop some really, really interesting complexity that you can then sort of pay for to the, the future vintages. Um, unlike Rob, I have my libraries, I call it my reserve library 
um, segregated uh, barrel by barrel, vintage by vintage. And um, I, I really like to both be able to revisit the different vintages. So I started my reserve program in 2011, kind of as a, a little bit as a secret, and uh, later had to confess to having 10 or 15 barrels um, in the cave. And fortunately it was met with open arms and not uh, there's the door. Um, we started to base a wine off of that. And um, it's been, again, part of the adventure of making sparkling wines. And it's a, it's a non-vintage wine uh, because it's utilizing all of these many vintages, but uh, these vintages of the past, but very deliberately trying to not make the same wine every year. I really want this to be um, sort of an unlocking of the handcuffs. That is vintage doesn't get to affect me. One particular vintage doesn't get to affect me. I get to be as creative as I possibly can year in and year out to make the most interesting wine I possibly can. Um, it's allotted uh, about four years on Tirage. So it's given a really, really beautiful sort of royal treatment. Um, one thing I found to be even more interesting than, or as interesting, but is in a given year, say 2021, I will assemble my Blanc de Blancs, my Blanc de Noir, my Brut Rosé uh, before the, the little red wine goes in. Um, what I like to do is actually make the blends a little bigger than what I'm actually planning on tiraging and then pull out a little bit of, of the tank before we bottle it again and then put that into the reserve program. So I have 2018 Blanc de Blancs, what went into bottle uh, in the cellar as uncarbonated, um, unsparkling base wine that's just continued to age. Um, I add a little bit of lees back to it because I think the lees uh, is sort of the lifeline of the wine in, uh, in, in the aging process. Um, so it's, again, it's, it's different colors to paint with. Um, it's a different perspective on um, how to sort of start a reserve program. Um, I, I love Rob's wines. I've had them many times and I love that interpretation too. And this is just a different spin on um, uh, sort of a way to do a reserve program. I love that. Um, I wanna leave a few minutes for questions, but maybe Roland, you can finish us off because you are a vintage wine producer. You're not, you're not <laughs> doing this multi-vintage thing. So uh, make the argument for vintage sparkling. I think the only reason I went that way, I mean, I, I've always admired uh, Bollinger where they, you know, they hold these wines, their, their reserve wines are held in magnums. And then they uh, pull the corks on this many magnums from this year and that year and blend it into their special cuvee. And so, I mean, that, that's how I cut my teeth uh, with, was with uh, visiting with those guys. And so it was pretty hard to push away from that idea. And I think it works great. Um, and, but I believe that these days we're, we, we maybe because of our viticulture and because of the clones that we've selected and where we're growing, we can be a bit more consistent. And the, the non-vintage idea came around a long time ago because, you know, in Champagne, uh, back in the day, they would have disasters, you know, they didn't understand crop. Uh, control. One thing Oregon uh, and the, as ahead of anybody in the world is starting in, I think, 1991, we started estimating crop to, you know, easy between five and 10 percent, which I always say is the one thing that that uh, has advanced quality for all wines here in the Willamette Valley is knowing what crop we have. But I do like those non-vintage wines, but I also enjoy making vintage ones because when I drink those wines, it, it's, you know, you could ask my wife, like, she'll ask me, okay, when was the last time we went to Italy? And I'll have no idea. But if she asked me, okay, hey, what was the growing season in, you know, 1988, I go, well, it started out like this and then it, you know. And I, I mean, I got it locked in. And so when I taste those wines that are vintage dated, it really sends me. One thing I can say also about non-vintage that's really cool that a lot of people don't uh, rem or realize, when you take a wine that's, maybe it has been pressed just great and you fermented it just wonderfully, but maybe, maybe you didn't take great care of it and it got a little bit oxidized in the barrel or in the tank. When you put that wine through a second fermentation, it really does freshen the wine up. 
it'll eat up some of that aldehyde and um, almost like it's a rebirth of a, of a fresh wine again. So that's why non-vintage can work uh, when you add older, older, older wines that you would never drink on their own. And, and then it gets new life reinvigorated. It's, you know, it's a rebirth. Every, every Tiburage is a rebirth. <laughs> mm-hmm. How do you like that line? Yeah, I like that. Well, we have a few minutes for questions. I'm wondering if we should take a few of these. And Julia, if you want to jump in and ask some of them for folks, please do. Um, one of them, um, I know there was a question about from Michael about favorite glassware for drinking Oregon sparkling. I've got my bubbles in an Oregon Pinot Noir glass. How about you guys? What are you using for your glassware? I think Robert's really loaded over there. Come on, buddy. Show us both of yours. Well, I have both of these. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and uh, they were both full when we started. Um, I'm, I, I can't say traditionalist, but um, I know the science says that you will have less carbonation over time versus this one. And there's all kinds of reasons to have this one. But um, when I first started um, accidentally, not accidentally, but um, someone very intentionally gave me some 61 Bollinger when I was 17 and it was in a crystal flute. And uh, I love flutes. I just, I just love the, the narrowness. I love how it approaches your palate. Um, I love the look and, you know, I'll drink anything out of this, but um, with sparkling wine, I'm a flute person and it's more aesthetics than anything else. So there's no, I, you know, I, I go against the science on that one. <laughs> well, wine, wine is a visual treat. It's not just the aromatics and the, and the flavors. It's also something, it's beautiful to look at. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, how about this question for Chris from- Wait, 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 let me show you this. This is a, I don't know if you can see this going here. Can oh, you see yeah. those little bubbles? Yeah. Isn't that cool? And that's been going on the entire seminar. Yeah. And so it's, that's what I'm looking at. <laughs> I was in Champagne and all these, all the tasting rooms were, you know, everybody was using these glasses and they're, they're made by Lehman Brothers. And uh, they're just, they're just really pretty. But I'm I'm with Rob, and I'll drink out of flutes, but I'll also drink out of white wine glasses, no problem, and even Pinot glasses. I'm not that picky. But if you want to see the expression of all these little, I mean, you don't get that kind of tiny little bubbles of growing grapes in warmer climates because cool climate grapes have more protein, and it the protein helps hold those bubbles in solution, so you get an opportunity to really enjoy those bubbles for a longer. Uh, period of time than you would in a warmer climate oh. and we would just want to show off that this is definitely willamette valley because it's got those itty bitty bubbles i love that glass Rollin. that's gorgeous yeah that's pretty yeah it's really pretty i'm i'm good with pretty much any glass that's at hand uh they give you a little bit different expression um i like i like a flute so i think a flute is um a very elegant way to to drink sparkling wine but if I can't find a flute, then I'll just find the next glass. And um, I think sparkling wine out of out of a sort of a burgundy bowl is totally acceptable. You lose carbon carbonation a little faster. Uh, the wine is a little more sort of expressive because of the uh, the, the surface area. But for me, it's uh, it's first to flutes. Well, look at it. I mean, it's really proper, great sparkling wine is something to, that's joyful. And it's like it's like looking at light that's being you know released into the atmosphere. It's it and and you drink it and it makes you feel light. And so even drinking in I call them slippers, you know those little coops. I I don't mind drinking out of those things at all. Uh, we were on a terror for like five years going to antique stores buying those little coops, and we'll have a coop party sometimes, and everybody's drinking out of those little you know Josephine cup things you know they're they're a blast and it, you know, you know a, the story of how those were supposedly first designed dainty first, dainty yes i yes i well i heard one version <laughs> marie antoinette's breast there you go <laughs> and those are fun too so you know don't get stuck <laughs> on it what we're trying to say here is just enjoy it man this just is, yeah. drink yeah. it yeah. If, if i'm buying it's a flute someone else is buying <laughs> I don't care. It can really- be- <laughs> I'm with Rob there. Yep. You can get some pretty ugly flutes though, depending on where you are. 
<laughs> I think it's all, all answers are correct. Mm -hmm. um, well, Julia, I think we're running out of time here. I, how, do we have time? Wait, wait. Yeah. We are. Can we take one question from the chat just because I got a series from, from Jeffrey here and there's one that I think is somewhat provocative. Um, in a on a kind of bigger picture scale with the perception of sparkling wine changing i think in among consumers especially in the us you have to you want to make the best wine he asks but you also have to sell it how do you incorporate what the consumer is looking for into your decisions where it like where do you strike that balance of what the consumer wants and what your artistry is robert's got that one for sure <laughs> well um to me, there's always a moral question. Um, it, it's a moral question. And I don't think um, any of us on this panel have um, big houses on the hill and are driving multiple fancy cars and stuff like that. Um, so I think that we all are in, in sync on this. I think the first thing is you gotta be profitable, otherwise you're not here next year. And um, so that's part of the equation. I look at what all my costs are and um, I look at uh, what I need to be profitable. And, you know, I have, it's not just me, there are five, six families that are dependent on our business being viable. So I, I can't give it away and I can't be too exorbitant. So it's a, it's a balance. Um, so it's, it's um, you know, I, I, look at, I look at what's fair. I always look at what's fair. To, to the people that work for us, to my family and to the consumer. Um, and, and if it has to go through a distributor, but most of our sparkling wines do not go through a distributor, um, then I have to think about them too, you know? But uh, it's, a, it's a fine question. That's a great question and thank you for asking. <laughs> I would say that, you know, um, um, you know, Jeffrey should get back on his bicycle cruise around but anyway just joking uh sparkling wine I, what i you know i love drinking champagne and there's and you know that throughout champagne there's some really ordinary ones but there's some stunners and i gotta say with willamette valley um grapes and the winemaking that we've achieved here that if if i was you know walking into a wine shop and i was going to buy a, a great bottle of champagne and by accident i bought any one of these uh, our three wines here, and I took it home and opened it, I would not be disappointed. And I would be going like, dang, you know, that was a deal uh, because they are a deal compared to, you know, where champagnes position themselves over time. And it's taken them hundreds of years to get there. And I, I, I firmly believe that the Willamette Valley is, is the greatest new world region in the world to grow sparkling wine. And I think it's something that we can get super serious about and that, that consumers can get excited about as well, that they will not be dis disappointed when they open up you know, a bottle of any of our wines uh, for sparkling wine. Yeah, agreed. Here, here. Here, here. <laughs> there you go, Kralik. Hey, you like that, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Should we wrap things up with a toast, Catherine? I think we should wrap things up with a toast. Um, Julia and I both would like to propose a toast to a truly beautiful person whom the Willamette Valley recently lost. And that is the one and only Maria Stewart. Maria's smile just lit up the streets of McMinnville. She made every visit to our Stewart & Co really, really special. And we all just miss her so much. Um, and we know that Maria wanted Rob to participate in this panel. So um, we, I'm gonna start crying. <laughs> we wanna de uh, dedicate this toast to her. So cheers yeah. to Maria. And yeah. to Absolutely. Rob for joining us and cheers to you all for attending tonight. Thank you. Cheers, everyone. Thank you. And our panel, you guys were amazing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, attendees. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, Catherine. Have an awesome night, everybody. And cheers to Willamette Valley Bubbles. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Catherine. Bye-bye. Thank you, Julia.